So the next speaker is, is someone who's well known to many of us because she was at Stanford prior to going to uh, University of Montana, uh, Renee Perra. She uh, has really pushed us at Stanford when she was here to really focus on human embryonic development and, and really uh, has been, the, I remember her telling me many times that mice are not men, we really need to think about human development and not, not just mouse development. And she's going to talk to us today about sequence or species-specific sequences that control uh, mammalian development. Renee. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It is such a pleasure to be here today. It's beautiful in California, and Stanford is particularly beautiful. Um, I am going to talk to you today about human development, timing, and species-specific sequences. So on the uh, first slide, do I actually control slides? Oh, I guess I do. Maybe that was something I was handed. <laughs> I see. <laughs> I thought it was a pointer, so I left it behind. Um, <laughs> so on the first slide, what you see is um, a historic uh, set of experiments that were done by Aristotle in the fourth century BCE. So developmental timing is very important, and this is really one of the first uh, images related to it. So in classic experiments, what Aristotle did was he took chick embryos across the 21 days of development, and he dissected them each day. And he concluded that generation from the egg proceeds in an identical matter, manner with all birds. But the full periods of timing, essentially, between birds might differ. He went on to describe the appearance of the embryo, the appearance of the heart, and then he actually made a, um, an assumption or he, and a conclusion that is really quite astonishing, and that is that he suggested that there were core programs essentially conserved across species that might even be conserved through human embryo development. And so, with this piece of work, uh, developmental timing was uh, laid out. Okay, so our hypothesis, or our big idea, is that the unique timing of human development is a product of conserved programs across many species, flies, worms, mice, and other species, so the, the unique timing is a product of these core programs, as well as human-specific elements that act to impact developmental timing, developmental progression, or the success or failure of human embryo development. And we think that ultimately, these human-specific elements may ultimately greatly impact our disease burden and aging. Okay, and so I'm going to go on to give you a little bit of a background of human embryo development, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about human-specific sequences. So on this slide, you see nine panels, beginning in the upper left-hand uh, corner, with the designation D0. That's a day zero human oocyte or egg, and there's an arrow pointing to the maternal pronucleus that carries the maternal chromosomes or maternal DNA. On day one, you can see that this embryo or this oocyte has been fertilized. A sperm has injected a second pronucleus at the darker arrow, and these two pronuclei, pronuclei one carrying the paternal DNA and one carrying the maternal DNA, migrate towards each other and fuse. And as they're doing so, a process called reprogramming is occurring. So essentially, in the day one embryo, one of the nuclei came from an egg and one of them came from a sperm. And we don't need global egg and sperm programs anymore. We need to reprogram from egg and sperm to human embryo and then the subsequent cell lineages that make up our body. And so there's an erasure program that's going on on day one that's removing the marks that uh, marked these pronuclei as egg and sperm. On day two, what you see is the embryo has gone 
through what's called its first cleavage division. It hasn't grown in size at all. It's essentially the size of a quarter of a point of a pin, so very small. The embryo hasn't grown in size, but it's duplicated its chromosomes and then divided from one cell to two cells. Later on day two, the embryo go, divides again, another cleavage division, no net growth in the size of the embryo, and it goes from two cells to four cells. And then late on day three, early on day three, the embryo divides one more time from four cells to eight cells. Now up to this point in development, the embryo has largely been in what's called transcriptional silence. Only a few gene products have been made. But on day three, what happens is the embryo for the very first time is reprogrammed and it turns on its own unique genes. Um, we have looked quite a bit at what is the clock. Essentially, I, what I've just told you is there is a clock so that the embryo is in some way counting to day three and then turning on its genes. And we're beginning to understand a little bit about what makes up that clock. We do know that the cell divisions themselves are not the timer. We think it's a molecular timer. Okay, and we know that just to uh, make it clear, we can look at embryos on day three that only have two cells, they are rested, and on day three they activate their genome or turn on their genes, even though they don't have this, uh, eight cells. Okay, so following day three, what happens is the embryo goes on to form 16 to 32 cells, shown on the panel that says D4, day four. Okay, on day four, the embryo be, uh, has two types of cells. There's cells on the outside, which will subsequently on day five go on to form the trophectoderm that will attach the embryo to the uterus. And there's cells on the inside that will go on to form the inner cell mass or as Magdalena uh, pointed out, eventually the epiblast and hypoblast. On day six, the human embryo hatches. It comes out of the little shell that's around us, around it, and it actually attach, it begins to attach. Human embryonic stem cells are derived from the inner cell mass, the light arrow on day five, that ultimately would go on to form the entire fetus. And as far as we know, human embryonic stem cells can form every different cell type of the body when they're uh, cultured in addition, differentiated. But the organization is not obviously uh, the same as in vivo in pregnancy. Okay, so that's my introduction to the human embryo. When I was at Stanford, I used to take this slide and teach it for an entire semester. So <laughs> you've gotten the shortened version. <laughs> um, so when I uh, joined Stanford in uh, 2007, one of the things that I wanted to do was to make a map of human embryo development that incorporated imaging data, in other words, movies of human embryo development, molecular data, the genes that are coming on and the genes that are being shut off, genetic data, what's the chromosome composition? Are there too many or too few chromosomes or just the right number? And then what's called epigenetic data, which is that reprogramming, erasure, and resetting type of data. And so what we did was we obtained a set of embryos that had been frozen down on day one and donated for research. And uh, some members of my laboratory in association with en engineering developed very small microscopes that could go in incubators and take pictures every five minutes of development. We uh, grew the embryos to six days, and along the way we removed a subset of the embryos, and we biopsied single cells to look at what genes are on and off, and then we also looked at a gene expression in the whole embryo. And so on the slide, uh, on the next slide, what you're going to see is the first, to our knowledge, complete movie of human embryo development.
Isn't it amazing? <laughs> it's just beautiful. So what we did was, um, in, this movie was made and this work was done in association with, or collaboration with our next speaker, Dr. Barry Bear. And what we did was something called tree analysis. We went back to the beginning of the movie, we measured as many factors as we could, and we asked the question, can we predict success or failure of embryo development early at the two to four cell stage before the, and thus transfer the embryos earlier in development? And could we also uh, predict longer term outcomes, like the ability to carry a pregnancy by, or the ability of an embryo to uh, uh, contribute to viable pregnancy that are associated with the early dynamic events of human embryo development. And so let me show you what this means. Okay, so our tree analysis led to us understanding some fundamentals of human embryo development. And the fundamental thing we learned is that we could predict whether or not an embryo was going to develop to the blastocyst stage, that stage that you saw where they hatch, by the four cell stage or by day two. And we, the factors that predict success or failure to reach this blastocyst stage are the time in the first cytokinesis. So if this is a one cell embryo, it forms a waste and then it's gonna divide into two cells. That's called the time in cytokinesis, when you see the waste and it's going to divide to two. In viable human embryos that don't have chromosomal abnormalities, that in general takes 15 plus, 15 plus or minus five minutes. That's an amazing, amazingly tight parameter. The second parameter is once there's two cells, how long does it take before the appearance of the third cell? And we found that that's 11 plus or minus four hours in viable uh, embryos. And then the third parameter that predicts success or uh, failure is once there's three cells, the fourth cell should appear within one hour of the third cell. And I can tell you a lot about the biology of why those things why those dynamic parameters predict success or failure. But um, what we found is that they're telling us information about what's happening inside, or what we call the molecular health of the human embryo. And so you can see on the top of this slide the timeline. Timing is fundamental to human embryo development, to the success of human embryo development. There's molecular programs that are running along the, as the uh, cells are dividing. We can image and make movies as we showed. And then we did something that's shown on the next slide and that's automated tracking. This movie is similar, but you should notice one difference or two differences. First, we see these circles and we generated computer programs that could determine whether or not an embryo was likely to be viable or non-viable. And ultimately, this technology was brought to the clinic. And what you see here is one of my favorite pictures because you have to look at the face of this man. He loves his wife, he loves the baby, and I think he loves the nurse too. <laughs> it's an amazing picture. But this is the first baby that was born using the computer, following the use of our computer generated uh, algorithms. And ultimately we got FDA approval a year later in uh, June of 2014. Okay, so what I'd like to say uh, to summarize this part of the talk is Timing is important. In fact, it's fundamental to human development. And we can uh, develop ways to look at timing and make predictions about outcomes. Okay, and so now let's move forward. Magdalena gave you a, a great introduction on what happens after the blastocyst after day six. 
This is just a diagram here showing the uh, formation of the epiblast and the hypoblast, and a process shown on the right uh, that's called gastrulation. Gastrulation is a process of cell movements in the embryo that ultimately leads to the formation of the endoderm, which gives rise to uh, systems or cell types like our intestine, the mesoderm, which gives rise to cell types like the uh, heart and uh, muscle, and the ectoderm, which gives rise to cell types like the skin or nervous system. One of the things that's been said is that uh, gastrulation is the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life, okay? So that, I don't know if that's comforting, <laughs> uh, but I always said gastrulation is the hardest thing you'll teach as a professor. <laughs> um, but in any case, the cell, uh, following the formation of the epiblast, ultimately the embryo will undergo gastrulation in order to f uh, form all of the different cell types of our body. In order to begin to understand uh, the formation of different cell types, we've turned to stem cell systems. There's two types of stem cells. I showed you a little di a diagram on the second slide of human embryonic stem cells that are derived from the human embryo. And there's also induced pluripotent stem cells. So I could take a skin biopsy from you add some genes that are normally just expressed in embryos, and we could make them go back in development to embryonic stem cell-like cells, okay? We can use these cells to begin to understand how do you go from a pluripotent stem cell, i.e. an embryonic-like cell, to making an intestinal cell, a muscle cell, or a neuron. Okay. Now, we do, uh, in order to begin to understand the uh, uh, pathways leading to differentiation of different cell types. They're all together called somatic cells. What we did is we collaborated with, um, oops, I'm not sure where I'm supposed to po point this. Um, we collaborated with Wing Wong's lab, and we did what is called hybrid sequencing of the pluripotent stem cells, human embryonic stem cells. We wanted to ask the question, what genes are on? And this hybrid sequencing allowed us to find new genes that had not been identified previously. These genes are diagrammed here. We found about 273 novel genes, in spite of the fact that human embryonic stem cells had been sequenced a lot, but using a particular method, and we changed the method. Um, we found that 273 novel genes, and these genes have a lot of these orange and blue sequences shown on this slide. And what that means is that they are highly enriched for retrovirally derived sequences that are human and close relatives, some non-human primates, uh, contain these sequences. But other species, such as the mouse, has their own whole set of genes, but do not have these uh, retrovirally derived sequences. We called these genes HPATs, for human pluripotency-associated transcripts, and we wanted to begin to understand. Are, these things are expressed in pluripotent stem cells in, from humans. Are they just artifacts of us culturing cells? or do they have a function? Okay, so the first thing we did was uh, we looked at the expression and characterized three of these genes called HPAT, human pluripotency associated transcript two, three, and five. We silenced these in one of two cells of human embryos that had been donated for research. And what you can see in the middle of this panel, that whole middle row, is in general, if we inject a dye into one of two cells of a human embryo, the cells contribute to this uh, trophectoderm that'll attach the embryo to the uterus, and they also uh, contribute to the inner cell mass that will, would ultimately give rise to the different cell lineages. But when we silence HPAT 2, 3, and 5, what you can see on the bottom panel here is that without the 
or with lower expression of these genes, the cells are only contributing to the trophectoderm or the cells that would the cells that attach the embryo to the uterus. They no longer contribute to the different cell lineages. So what this slide says is, although these sequences are human-specific, came into our genome somewhere in the egg and sperm lineage, are human-specific, are not necessarily widely conserved, they function in a key part of human embryo development. Now, beyond the blastocyst, we've chosen uh, to use stem cells to begin to understand the function of these genes. On the left-hand side of this a little bit busy diagram, what you can you see is some of the tools we can use to probe function of genes and stem cells. We can look at single gene expression. We can knock the genes completely out using something called CRISPR analysis. We can collect data on the, uh, how they change the uh, molecular biology of the cell if they're overexpressed or knocked out. And on the right, you can see that we can look in the embryo and we can look at what other genes the, uh, uh, these HPATs might be regulating or might be regulated by. And this allows us to drop a model that addresses our hypothesis that I showed earlier in the uh, talk. And in this model, um, I'm only going to point to one thing. On the right-hand side there, you see a term called LET7. LET7 was one of the first genes in worms identified that encoded what is called a microRNA, and it's called a heterochronic microRNA in C. elegans or in worms. So what does a heterochronic uh, gene do in worms? It's a timer. And so what we think is happening as we look at this model is that these human-specific sequences are impacting fundamental timing of human development, human embryo development. And so with that, let me just uh, stress a few things. The first is human embryo development is amazingly beautiful and amazingly fragile. Most embryos don't make it. Human embryo development is characterized by the expression of human-specific genes that might regulate human-specific dynamics such as timing and survival or demise. These uh, species-specific transcripts were identified by this uh, process of hybrid sequ sequencing and they may modulate fundamental cell fate decisions in the human embryo by promoting timing of uh, transition state changes from a two cell to a four cell to an eight cell to a morula and a blastocyst and beyond. We know that aspects of both human development and human disease can be modeled in vitro uh, and most effectively by the uh, stem cell systems that I to, uh, showed you the human embryonic stem cells and induced pluri pluripotent stem cells. Timing matters, okay? Not just in real estate, <laughs> but in human development as well. Timing is really, really important. And here's my uh, thought on disease uh, and timing. So the concept is if two cells pass each other by during development, the opportunity to form connections or to influence each other and ultimately impact the fate of each other could be lost forever. That may have fundamental implications for our development and ultimately for our disease state. And I'll talk about that in the last couple minutes that I have. And so finally, this is a little bit of a leap of faith, number five. But I'm suggesting that human disease and aging 
might be associated with increased variability, cellular noise, in gene expression that may lead to cell demise. And this may be regulated in a species-specific manner. So what would I do next? What we want to know is, are there lineage-specific, retrovirally-derived, long non-coding RNAs that are fundamentally important for cell fate decisions in humans? The evidence suggests there are. We'd like to probe function of these genes in human germ cell development, development of the egg and the sperm. Remember that these are retrovirally derived sequences. So if, this, so if I'm standing here and I get a viral infection in my head, it's not entering the human uh, genetic lineage, genome or the uh, progeny. And so what I'm, I'm trying to say is that retroviral sequences had to infect the germ cell lineage, the egg and the sperm, in order to be carried from one generation to the next. And in order for that to happen, they had to be beneficial or at least not detrimental to human development. And then finally, I would suggest there are many diseases that are, are associated with the loss of a particular cell population. And so I'd like to probe the role of long non-coding RNAs in the development, in embryonic development, of particular types of neurons. So dopaminergic neurons that are lost in Parkinson's disease. We're all born with 50 to 75,000 dopaminergic neurons of the class that are, is lost in Parkinson's disease. And the hypothesis that I laid out is that, if cell, that it's necessary for cells to arrive at a certain place at a certain time and impact each other. And if they don't arrive there at the same time, perhaps we don't get 50 to 75,000 dopaminergic neurons of a certain subclass. And we lose them earlier in life and have an earlier onset of Parkinson's disease. And so I'd like to say that the tools are available to probe for the very first time in the history of science to probe fundamental questions like what is the, what is the function of these genes in the human germline? We all, we are shown on this slide, we can make germ cells, we can look at molecular programs that are required to make germ cells, and we can track, as shown on the right-hand side of this slide, uh, cell division and cell timing as events are occurring. We also have the tools to make neurons. In this paper, we made neurons that are dopaminergic neurons. We can show that they fire. And if they're derived from people that carry uh, Parkinson's disease, they are more susceptible to um, toxins, environmental toxins, and they die sooner than other neurons from the same person, or neurons that are dopaminergic from people who don't have Parkinson's. And so the tools are in place to address our big idea, idea our hypothesis, um, and to uh, move forward. And so with that, I'd like to leave you with a pretty picture. Um, <laughs> please visit Montana. <laughs> and just, I do have to make one correction. I am from Montana State University now, not the University of Montana, the rivals. <laughs> there's something called, there's the um, Continental Divide competition. We are on e uh, opposite sides of the Continental Divide, and we prefer the eastern side. Thank you very much. So there's a microphone over here if you'd like to ask questions. We have time for a couple of questions for Renee. I'm trying to move out of the light a little bit, but I think it's not possible. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> so these retroviral elements are, are interesting because they have conserved function but not conserved sequences, which may, has a number of implications. Can you address that? So um, that's a really interesting uh, thing, a uh, question, because LET7 is highly conserved, but it's being regulated by something that's human-specific. And that's what makes me think that these are timers. These are molecular timers. They aren't, if you knock out HPAT5, you don't kill the cell, you just 
uh, change the timing or the balance between pluripotency or an embryonic state and differentiation. And so I believe that as we develop that we have many, many timers that come on because one cell is next to another cell and that that's ultimately important for uh, normal development and it's also what contributes to variability. Another Virginia? question, Virginia? Yeah. Renee, thank you so much. I really enjoyed the movie of the <laughs> early human <laughs> embryo. Thank um, you. So my questions are actually directed towards that. Uh -huh. um, in the movie, it looked like once you got to the blastocyst stage, there was almost a pulsatile release of fluid or the size of, of the cavity change. Yeah. Is that actual or was that artifactual in terms of playing, you know, seeing a different size? No, I remember the first time we saw that movie, and that is actually what's happening. The embryo is bringing in and expelling fluid, so it's moving like that. And ultimately, I think that's the movement that leads to hatching. So it has a little shell around mm -hmm. it that it has to come out. So and is it understood what's changing at the molecular level that's now allowing that transport of fluid? Because you, you, know, st you start out with a, this ball of cells, and then very quickly there, you develop that, that cavity. Um, that's so interesting. So Virginia is an expert in the extraembryonic tissues, um, which I know less about. Um, but what's interesting is that um, I think there must be some changes in the gene expression or in the signaling in those extra embryonic tissues that are actually regulating that. It's not at the inner cell mass level because it's actually inside of the embryo. So the extra embryonic tissues must allow uh, the formation of pores and the opening and closing of those mm -hmm. pores. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Renee. Thank you.